the motto and the symbol under which this visit went was India, the European Union and Belgium stronger together. And I want to thank India Incorporated and Manoj Ladwa for coming up for this. It was really apt and wonderful. Dr. Ganguly, the Honorable Prime Minister of India has been leading the charge. But it is you who has encapsulated his thoughts and his visions in this wonderful publication. I would be very grateful if you would take the floor and address us. Thank you very much. Here, before you and before this august audience, I would like to thank you for your energy, for your determination, and for the for the support <coughs> that you gave us unstintingly to see this day come true. Honorable Member of the Indian Parliament, Swapan Dasgupta, reading whom and listening to whom we have shaped our world view since years. It is indeed a great honor to be standing before you and being able to say a few words. And uh, the Right Honorable Shishil Bajoria, my great friend, who's uh, been after this, conceiving this program for quite a while now. When we uh, presented the Modi Doctrine finally to the Honorable Prime Minister of India on 9th September, he asked us one pointed question. He said, are you evolving it as a philosophy? <coughs> so I could only tell him in the, in the, in the course of the, that moment that it is an emerging doctrine. There's no finality because the final has not come. Therefore, the Modi doctrine is an evolving one. And as the years go by, as perhaps every day goes, today itself, one can see the evolution of this broad doctrine. Two years ago, when the Modi government came to power with a decisive mandate, it rode on the expectations of change in our society, responding to the mood of the nation. <clears throat> Before the election, there was a perceptible sense of drift in policy, whether domestic or external. And the feeling, particularly among the younger generation, was that India deserved better and we could, in fact, do better. Much of it was focused on better quality, on a better quality of life and a greater security, especially against terrorism. But in looking out at the world, there was also a growing feeling that we could contribute more and shape its future. <coughs> Consequently, the Narendra Modi government came in with more ambitious goals, bolder policies to achieve them, and a commitment to more effective delivery. Two years later, much progress has been made in addressing the external aspects of this endeavor. What must be stressed is the linkage between domestic and foreign policy. This is the key to understanding what we have termed as the Modi doctrine. It is not just that policy and priorities are articulated differently from the past. And as External Affairs Minister Honorable Sushma Swaraj says, at the heart of the change is a vision of India's place in the world its relationship with the international community and indeed an understanding of a rapidly transforming world itself. This then is one of the defining fundamentals of what we have tried to term as the Modi doctrine. Prime Minister Modi has spent a significant amount of time in his first two years in office in improving the quality of India's engagement with the world. With practically no political experience at the national level and with an election campaign that hardly emphasized on foreign policy, 
His approach to diplomacy has been quite remarkable. Remarkable in the sense that he has not only energized the foreign office, but brought in an unaccustomed, out-of-the-box and forward-looking approach to India's engagement with the world. In a complex and dynamic world, where states are far more interconnected, assessment regarding the processes and outcomes of foreign policy is important. Foreign policy involves many things, including goals, strategies, measures, and methods. It also requires effective leadership. A leader-influenced foreign policy helps in shaping a narrative or a worldview through effective communication and coordination. It can repair a nation's image, restore or increase its relative power position, and assume leadership role in international and regional institutions. Prime Minister Modi has demonstrated all this in redefining India's position in the world, and this has been amply captured by us, by the authors, in, in, uh, by the contributing authors as well, in the writings in this volume. But this edited volume follows a fundamental tenet of publishing, and that is objectivity. As editors, we have been conscious to ensure that there have been no omission of facts and that nothing to the best of our understanding has been omitted for the purpose of concealing or glossing over. The volume is divided in three sections and has 21 essays. And what is even more uh, uh, encouraging is that the revised edition has, this is the first time that the revised edition sees the light of day here in Brussels. This has not even been launched in India because within two months of the launching, it was all sold out. And then the developments with Pakistan took place and it was decided that we would revise it and bring it out. So therefore what you have here is oven fresh for the first time out. <laughs> many, many of the contributions are from noted foreign experts closely watching <clears throat> India. The first section titled Modi a global leader but India first captures the Prime Minister's nuanced approach his leadership and understanding of the world affairs. Earlier this year in September when there was a town hall commemoration of the second year of the government, Prime Minister, when pointedly asked what is the defining goal or objective or fundamental of your foreign policy, simply said, India first. The second section, Raj Mandala of Bilateral Regional Connect has country specific essays that build on the bilateral momentum and examine future prospects. The third section, thematically tied to the world, contextualizes and examines India's pattern of engagement through the lens of development imperatives. The theme becomes the categories for analyzing of Prime Minister Modi's foreign policy. A common thread runs through the edited volume, and that is that India's diplomacy under Prime Minister Modi has a go-getting edge and is set to leverage its role and make itself a <coughs> diplomatic superpower. We are often asked, what are the contours of a Modi doctrine? Or what are the pillars, the sustaining pillars of a Modi doctrine? Well, we can only, uh, try and articulate what is a Modi doctrine. Multi-alignment, multi-engagement, Assertive alliances. There's something very unique in this effort. Is that Prime Minister Modi's foreign policy sees the world in terms of possibilities rather than risks. And as Finance Minister Arun Jaitley in his introduction beautifully, in his foreword beautifully puts it. India's rise under Modi is aspirational, people-centric non-elitist, almost subaltern. I have tried and termed the sustaining pillars of Modi doctrine as Panchamrit, as opposed to Panchil. And Panchamrit, the Panchamrit concept was proposed in the BJP's national resolution in April 2015. And these comprises of five pillars. They are Samman, that is dignity and honor. Samvar, 
that is greater dialogue and engagement, samriddhi that is prosperity and shared prosperity, suraksha that is global, regional, national security, <coughs> sanskriti and sabhyata that is culture and civilizational connect. All five of these pillars have been upheld in the last two and a half years and there has been much proactive effort in sustaining these and in projecting these as pillars of <laughs> India's foreign policy. There is also a development story in Prime Minister Modi's foreign policy and the entire gamut of discussion that took place today here with Make in India, Skill Development are all enmeshed in the vision of his, in the vision and action of his foreign policy. The ambassador, honorable ambassador of Nepal is here, therefore I must stress that one more defining pillar of his foreign policy is, of his foreign policy doctrine is neighborhood first and act east. Among the first visits that Prime Minister Modi made after taking over was Bhutan. And one of our authors has <laughs> even termed that he is perhaps the most internationalist Prime Minister since Prime Minister Modi. Diaspora, as we have seen in this documentary, is a key critical driver of Prime Minister Modi's foreign policy. You have then the approach of civilizational connect, of reaching out in terms of soft power capacities and potential. Last year in September, Prime Minister Modi initiated a huge conference of Buddhist nations and he called it a conference on conflict avoidance and environmental consciousness. Essentially, what he talks about is not conflict resolution, but conflict avoidance. Not environmental regulation, but environmental consciousness. And that is where he came up with the term of climate justice. And later on, we saw him put forth the Bodh Gaya Declaration in which he clearly spoke about the need to develop Bodh Gaya as a center, as a world center of Buddhism. Because it is clear for him that without Buddha, the Asian century, uh, the 21st century cannot be an Asian century. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I shall not really stand much before uh, our eminent member of parliament, but reiterate quickly what we have perceived again as the first seeds or as the, uh, as the sustaining pillars of the Modi doctrine, <coughs> tight integration of domestic and foreign policy, <laughs> overcoming hesitations of history. In fact, PM Modi re received the highest civilian award of Saudi Arabia and Iran in a, in a span of a few weeks. So that's what I have termed pragmatic alliances. Reaching the unreached or engaging the unengaged. It has been decided that the ministers of the Indian government will fan out to all countries that have not yet been visited by an Indian minister in the last 70 years. The Asia-Pacific uh, Heads of State Summit in Jaipur. You had the India-Africa Summit where a record number of 54 countries, heads of state came forward to participate. There is a very clear message that India under Prime Minister Modi is engaging with the unengaged. Of course, we have then, and which is the final and perhaps the most current one, is reinventing or overcoming strategic restraint. If it is India first, and if it is India's interest that needs to be upheld, even there, there is no hesitation. There is a clear message. So, in conclusion, I can only say that as his approach has been domestically, Prime Minister Modi's approach on the international field has been that of outreach, of harmonization, and of opportunities. <coughs> as 
Finance Minister Arun Jaitley says it beautifully that there is a there is a development story, there is a story of aspiration, and there is a clear will and urge for India to graduate from being a balancing power to becoming a leading power. I think these are broadly one one, one cannot really define at this moment what a Modi doctrine is, but these are efforts and this could be broad pointers to what it can possibly be. I'm extremely grateful to all of you for being so patient with me. I'm not a foreign policy analyst or a specialist. And I'm extremely uh, grateful to the uh, Europe India Chamber of Commerce, to Secretary General Prasad, to Chairman Merotra for uh, having invited us to go here. Uh, I shall cherish this moment for a long time to come, especially because this is uh, one of those unique launches that we have done here in European Union, underlining importance that it has in Prime Minister Modi's vision. Thank you so much. Ambassador Puri, Mr. Mario Trump, Chairman of the European Union. Chamber of Commerce, Secretary General Mr. Prasad, ladies and gentlemen. Ambassador Puri, in his brief audiovisual presentation on the 17 hour visit of the Prime Minister, I think quite unwittingly, or maybe consciously, drove home a very large point. And I can understand the significance of that because having just been in Brussels for just over 24 hours, I sometimes find myself quite overcome with jet lag, quite overcome by sleep <coughs> and wanting to sort of keel over. Now, one of the features of Narendra Modi, which I call perhaps his madness, is that his energy is something to remark, is quite remarkable. He and I share a doctor. And the doctor once remarked to me that the tragedy of going with Mr. Travelling with Mr. Modi to a foreign land is that we don't ever sleep the night in a hotel. He insists we travel overnight on the plane. So conserving every hour has become a feature of Mr. Modi's time, which is why he's been able to cover such a long distance. Now, Anirban Ganguly, when he presented this book to the Prime Minister, was told, is there a doctrine by the man whose doctrine it is supposed to represent? And I can understand, there is a certain weariness which comes about when the word doctrine is used. It assumes a degree of fixity. It, uh, it assumes a measure of certitude, which in foreign policy sometimes doesn't work. I'll share this with a recollection. In 2014, I was quite involved with the planning of the election campaign. In 2014, we noticed one thing, that the image of Narendra Modi, which was transmitted all over India, <coughs> was not a single image. There were very many people who saw him as a strong man. Some extended that strongman image into seeing him as a sort of a modern reincarnation of Shivaji, who was a sort of very strong Hindu ruler who fought against the Mughals. There were others who saw him as a free marketeer, perhaps an Indian variant of Margaret Thatcher. Yet others saw him as a member of the backward castes. 
And finally, there were those who were inspired by this tale of a man, sort of the log house, uh, log cabin to White House story. The man from very humble beginnings who'd risen so far. And at a time, we thought there are too many divergent sort of impressions being created. Should we try and harmonize it to give one fixed image of a leader? We consulted a lot of people. And I think the best response came from someone who said, I just leave it. Isn't it wonderful if a leader appeals to six or seven different constituencies by being himself? So I think when we talk about a doctrine, and that's why I was quite, I find an unabound use of the term Panchamrit quite appealing. Because there are five spokes, five pillars, if you may, on which his foreign policy is based. Now they are loose enough to incorporate degrees of flexibility. But at the same time, there is, there can be, Issues of intransigence, and that's the India first element. And what does he mean by India first? Again, I'll go back, I'll perhaps go back to, I'll, I'll approach this with a sort of anecdotal way. I remember in 2007, there were elections in Gujarat, and at that time, Mr. Modi had done something which appeared to a lot of people as being very controversial. He had made electricity, he had given assured electricity to almost everyone. But he would also cut off electricity to those who would not pay. And in our, and in certain parts of rural Gujarat, where pilfering <coughs> electricity is quite rampant, he had actually initiated proceedings against those who had pilfered electricity. Now, about 75,000 such cases had been registered. Now, political parties being what they are, election time, you had a big delegation of people who came and said, you know, you must waive this. This is election time. You know, abandon those cases, give it up. So in the course of drafting the election manifesto, a line was put in, there would be a remission or the cases against those things will be abandoned. I remember taking that draft manifesto, Arun Jaitley and me, we went to Modi ji and Gandhi Nagar. He flipped through the thing. Most people here, I mean, in India, manifestos are sometimes purely decorative. He flipped through it and suddenly he stopped at that particular point and says, Ye kya hai? What is this? So, Mr. Jaitley tried to explain to him, yeah, we've got a lot of representation of people. He says, Nick, cut this out, cut this out. Mr. Jaitley again insists, but the people in the party are suggesting this. He said, can you elect someone else to lead the campaign? He said, it is after a very long time he managed to get the state electricity boards out of the rate. They are now viable public sector units. If you start this, they'll go back into deficit once again. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that when you're talking about foreign policy or domestic policy, there are certain non-negotiables. And in this case, Mr. Modi is guided by a strong <laughs> sense of right and wrong. Of what is right and what is wrong. And in this case, he thought that pilferage of electricity was ethically wrong and there would be no compromises with it. Whether he'll be able to keep up with this principle throughout his political career, I don't know. But I think it suggests something. It suggests 
that along with the sense of drive and energy, there are certain moral fixities which he has. And this is coupled in the approach to the in foreign policy, his background in Gujarat. And I think that's very important and I know there are a large number of members of the Gujarati diaspora here. And I think it's important to understand that when it comes to viewing the world, Gujarat has shaped his consistently. Not least of which, which he often used to tell me, is that Gujarat is a land which doesn't really have too much of natural resources. What we have is an elaborate coastline. So we've always been traders. And trading not merely within India, it's trading with the world. Whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Southeast Asia, whether it's in the United States, or whether it's in Europe. And therefore, for him, foreign policy and economics was always interlinked. It was not something separate. In the days when we were discussing the planning to the gov of governance, he used to often say that the problem, and with due apologies to members of the Foreign Service who would be here, said part of the problem <coughs> lies is that some people believe that <coughs> diplomacy is attending parties' purposes. <coughs> All Indian embassies, in his view, should principally be center of India's economic activity. Apart from the neighborhood where there are other considerations at play. So to transform India's, diploma, in India's diplomatic outposts into basically trading points, into hubs which will facilitate the growth, which will facilitate the economic progress and the larger economic relationship of India was, is a very, very important point which he had. <coughs> and I think it's important to consider all this when we talk about Mr. Modi's larger vision. You know, the, there is often a feeling, there was a feeling before he became Prime Minister, that a man whose administrative experience had been limited to Gujarat would never be able to cope with the intricacies in the world of diplomacy. And I think this was centered on a certain elitist assumption that only some people with a certain background can only manage that. I think Mr. Modi, what they did not realize is that for Mr. Modi, there was another vision which was driving him. And I'm trying to extrapolate, I'm trying to explain that in the sense that unlike a lot of leaders, Mr. Modi did not think the third world is a badge of honor. He always thought of the third world as a point of denigration, of India's failure to live up to its potential, India's failure to live up to its civilization. In Gujarat, for example, in Gandhinagar, there is an elaborate conference center which has been built. It's really huge. And in that, he used to have this vibrant Gujarat summit. There are two things about this thing. One is, one year, I went to the uh, vibrant Gujarat summit and I found various seminars being conducted, fishing opportunities in British Columbia, <coughs> or was it Newfoundland? Remark to somebody. Bit esoteric, don't you think so? He said, you may find it esoteric, but what is important in this case is that I have arranged each day for small enterprises, people who own small businesses, to come here, 
Not necessarily because they are going to invest in the fisheries of Newfoundland, but because it will expose them to different ideas. And he said, second point which he said is that I want to make this in the coming days into something like a DevOps. Far bigger in scale, maybe not with the same elitist orientation. And this conference center has been built keeping in mind that we shouldn't do anything shoddy. You know, one thing in India that there's a philosophy called Chalta hai, which means you settle for the second best <coughs> and explain it we are a poor country. He was, he basically fund, he fundamentally is against that. Which is why some people say he's an event manager. It's not him being an event manager. When he hosts, when he has a program in the Madison Square Garden, he would like to make it world class. Yes, it may be a little expensive. But if you're having a grand event, it must also be a grand spectacular. Because at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're ending up getting a large number of Indians who are settled or temporarily resident in the United States there. The grander the show, the greater the pride in their own country that we can do this. And I think part of the problem which we often faced in the, in, in the past was that the disconnect between the Indian diaspora, many of whom basically left India because they didn't have economic opportunities. Because they found the environment of India, economic environment of India quite stifling. That's why they left it and made a good day. Uh, they did rather well overseas. They created good businesses. They became good, extraordinary professionals, etc. But they connect with their <coughs> ancestral homeland was with a time war. They remembered India as it was when they left it. At a time when we used to, what we used to call the shortage economy was what ruled the rules. So the idea of connecting back to India had to be that here is a country which is now aggressively on the move. Here is a country which is now trying to re-establish its rightful place in the world. What Anirban spoke about. And if the diaspora is convinced of that. The multiplier effect of that in terms of goodwill is far greater and can offset all the negative letters due to the editor which appeared in the New York Times or the Guardian. Because Mr. Modi was also confronted with a very unique problem. He was a prime minister who came to power despite the Indian intelligentsia, not because of it. And it was that disdain which confronted him all along. The unfavorable comparisons which were made with other, I, I don't want to name other leaders of other countries. So when the decisive actions happened, there was an attempt to often say, oh, that but this is terrible, this is fashion. I mean, today there's been a huge, in the battle against corruption in India, everybody recognizes that one of the biggest impediments to doing business in India have been two things. One is red tape and bureaucratization, and the second is a culture where integrity actually took a secondary role, what we call corruption, graft. And in this battle against graft, the, the decisive measures which have been taken, and the one taken earlier this evening, the demonetization of 500 and 100 rupee notes, yes, it will cause a temporary blip. 
But in terms of sheer decisiveness, it's a frontal assault which no other leader has been able to take. And I think it's very important to recognize that for Mr. Modi, sometimes the electoral outcome he believes is by doing the right thing, not necessarily by cutting corners and making compromises. I recall the last public meeting in 2002 when we were there, we were both flying into Jamnagar for the and this was a viciously fought election to come really it was vitriolic I mean, which makes it was as ugly as the American election campaign which is going and so he asked me he says what do you think so I said it looks comfortable so he says and what if we lose I said, we lose we lose he thought back for a little while and said well at least I did the right thing. I am happy with that. The results will come. So it's always that. That you've got a mandate, which is a mandate which has been accompanied by a tremendous amount of public trust. And you must fulfill that mandate despite unsettling and upsetting even your core supporters. And I can tell you, this demonetization, this uh, Rattle against corruption has actually upset a lot of the constituents who are actually the core voters of the BJP. So, this is really in terms of the foreign policy. In this, as an approach in domestic policy, translates into things about foreign policy, which right, the final point which I want to make is the rapidity and quickness of decision making. Brexit, which you all discussed some weeks ago, I mean uh, uh, an hour ago, the day after Brexit happened, he, he rang me up and said, what do you think of this result? In my, whatever it was called. And he says, Brexit is a reality now. So I said, yeah, it seems a reality. That was before the High Court judgment. Obviously, you cannot anticipate what the law lords are thinking. And he said, figure out ways in which we can turn this into our advantage. So, from the very first day, he was at work, and I'm sure he must have called various other people and people on the line. How does India benefit? I heard a talk about a, a story about President Reagan. He used to have the habit whenever a new American ambassador was being posted to a country, he would call, I guess not all of them, but some of them. And then one of the questions he would ask is, uh, and which country do you represent? And the man would say, India, China, Britain. Belgium, Holland, he would say, no, you don't. You represent the United States and don't you ever forget it. And I think that's really the point which Mr. Modi has made. So this might lead to occasional awkwardness with other countries, but the important thing here is that at least India's perspective will be known clearly and unambiguously. And second point linked to this is that India's preachiness, which was often a source of great irritation, I know, in Western countries, the fact that we used to sermonize for the heck of it. In America, they, in, in the 60s, they used to taunt people and say, you give a sermon, and the next time you ask for shiploads of wheat to be delivered. India no longer preaches. But I think India no longer is there with a begging bowl. 
India now expects what is our contribution, what is the contribution we can make in the world. And I think this shift, where a decisiveness in foreign policy is accompanied by a rapid capacity building domestically in the economy, I think it is a game changer. The Modi doctrine probably will have to be written 50 years later. Because that's what the history of all doctrines are written. At present, what we can appreciate and what we can actually assist is the attempt of India, a very audacious attempt of India, to recover its self-esteem both globally and domestically. And I think Mr. Modi has taken a very pivotal role in facilitating that exercise. I thank Anirban for bringing out, at least to a larger audience, the basic tenets which govern it, some of which I'm sure the third and the fourth editions will probably have to do subsequent to revision. And thank you, Ambassador Puri, and thank you, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Prasad, for making this discussion possible. Thank you very much. Ambassador Puri. My dear Swapanda, in Bengal we, <coughs> we address the elder person as da, Dada, Honorable Member of Parliament, dear friend Anirvan, I won't call you that, Sri Barotra, mm. ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We have heard a lot about the Modi doctrine. Obviously, I'm not going to stand here and speak about the book anymore. But first of all, I'd like to thank the Honorable Member of Parliament, Swapanda. During elections, when he spoke about the various images people had of then Prime Ministerial candidate, Mr. Narendra Modi, and they, few of them got into a huddle to think, can we give it a common image? Thank you very much that you have concluded that you will not give a common image and you let the six or seven images be there because that's how people of India voted. People of India do not vote for a common person and that's why after 30 years, ladies and gentlemen, we have now a government which is a single party majority government. So good that they had a they could not conclude maybe and that's why they decided to keep to the six. Uh, well, today we would have also had the privilege of hearing the second, the other editor, Mr. Vijay Chothai uh, He had to stay back in Delhi because of uh, pressing commitments arising out of the British Prime Minister's visit. But uh, it's really... Uh, Mr. Vijay Chothaiwale and Anirban, and, uh, who really helped me in putting this whole event together. And then, of course, the support I got from the chairman of EICC and the secretary general of EICC that I could be a bridge for today's event. I cannot not speak a few words on our present Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi. A unique person in democracy, there are very few, I have not heard of any. A person who walks into the Gujarat Assembly, that's our local parliament of a state, for the first time in his capacity as chief minister, he repeats this feat when he walks into the Indian parliament for the first time, he walks in, as, in his capacity as the prime minister. There are not many elected representatives who have this track record, but he is one of them. Yes, it's a fact that when he became Prime Minister, there was a lot of speculation, and especially in the intelligentsia, uh, me being a Calcutta, and we always look at Delhi, and we take a dig at Delhiites, and we have one Calcutta who has been exported to Delhi. We have these people from St. Stephen's College, and they really think that they are the intelligentsia, but you're not. 
So you exported to Delhi. So I had to take a degree. Come on, so I had to take a degree. They all thought, can Modi run foreign policy? It's a fact, what he said, I won't elaborate. But see the foreign policy that, the foreign diplomacy that we did with the human face. Look at the evacuation that India did in times of crisis. And I'll quote a figure. In Yemen, we evacuated 6,710 people. 1,962 of them came from 48 different countries. That was one hell of an effort. Uh, today, uh, special thanks to our friends from Antwerp. Mr. Kothari, Mr. Shah and the team and of course uh, the person who spoke to me on the phone and coordinated your visit, uh, Harsh Bhai, the MLA from Surat. Uh, it's really nice that you all could come in big numbers to witness this. Just before this panel was the panel on Brexit, just to balance the books. While this launch happens today of the second edition, by the month end, we will do a similar launch in London as well. So we are not forgetting Britain, whether they exit or they don't exit. Very special thanks to the Indian ambassador, Mr. Manjeet Puri, the kind of support that we got from him and his entire team. Ambassador Saab, your team really went beyond the call. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm in politics, but I come from the commercial world. So my last line will be commercial. The book is here for sale. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as His Excellency the Ambassador is telling the last such wonderful and remembering uh, functions are never closed. They are, they are enshrined. And I would like to enshrine this uh, tip. Uh, this is number eight. Am I right? Number four. Number four. So, it cannot be closed. It has to continue. People have to talk about it. And as this open has mentioned, that it is the different images of Modi which created the web for the people to buy in it is no success of it. So we have to also keep these images with us so that we can always buy in it. And that's how we can support EICC and which can bring India and Europe together. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for <clears throat> coming here and being a very ardent listener to our long talks. But we have managed to complete our program. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, family, and uh, wish them the best of luck in the sale of their books. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.